Namaste and welcome to the book launch of Invading the Sacred, an analysis of Hinduism studies in America. I would like to request the publisher, Kapish Mehra, to come up and say a few words before we launch the book. It is my uh, pleasure, privilege to welcome all of you on the occasion of the release of Invading the Sacred. Uh, simply not only because it's another book launch, uh, another event in the publishing profile of a company, but slightly more than that. There are various books that are published every year by us. We do about 250 annually, new books annually. But then there are, there are those books that are slightly special. Special not only because if you would have noticed a copy of the book doesn't necessarily mention the subject that it fits in because sometimes it encomp encompasses so many but more so because it brings to light aspects that need to be talked about need to be uh, analyzed as the subtitle says and more importantly discussed and I think this is an excellent opportunity it's been obviously uh, one journey uh, to be able to bring forth this book and I'm glad to mention that this is not only a one book journey, but a series of books that we are planning to go ahead with. Uh, something that we are very um, passionately uh, following and uh, would want it to see the light of the day very soon. But uh, just would like to add that various books that are published, as I mentioned, are published for different reasons. Some are published uh, because they make a lot of commercial sense. Some are published because uh, they probably are the flavor of the day. Some are published because uh, to please some people. Some are published uh, because it's an excellent work of art. Some are published because they're landmarks before they're published. But then there are some books that are published that just need to be published without a definition. And I'm very proud to mention that uh, Invading the Sacred is one of those books. Uh, but having said that, being a publisher, there's always a commercial aspect to it. So we're very happy to have published this. I'm sure you'll help us make this a commercial success as well. Thank you so much. People have been asking me how I'm involved with this book launch. I'm involved because I believe in what this book is trying to do. I became aware of this very serious issue of uh, very faulty academic writings, the blatant use of Freudian psychoanalysis as a license for writing whatever anybody wanted to write about Indic culture, and to denigrate it in such a way that our future generations would become more and more ashamed to acknowledge their own culture. And the fact that these writings are written by people who hold the highest positions in the US Academy makes it even more serious. They hold chairs and occupy chairs, and they are on the boards of Encyclopedia Britannica, and they are invited to write in Microsoft and Carta, and so on. So it's not just some freak who's writing these things. They're very, very important people. And that's what makes it even more serious. So as a layman and a very concerned Indian, I thought that it was important, besides all the very peaceful work I do, my chanting and my music and my involvement with the scriptures and my education work, I thought it was very important that I get involved in this issue and try to create some consciousness in India. People in America are more conscious of this, the diaspora knows about it, but most people in India were absolutely ignorant about this issue and I thought it was important that we know about it and we do something about it. So here we are. I'll leave the experts to speak more about this issue, and I would like to invite 
one of the editors of the book, Aditi Banerjee, to come and introduce the book and the issue. And a little note on her. Aditi Banerjee received a BA in International Relations from Tuft, Tuft University and a doctorate in law for, from Yale Law School. Her publications include The Hyphenated Hindus in Outlook India, Hindu American, both sides of the hyphen, and a chapter in the book Buddhist Hindus and Sikhs in America. And this was done by Oxford University Press. So she's been very modest. She hasn't written much more about this, but she's, she's uh, very fiery in her writings, very logical, and a very important practicing lawyer in America. So Aditi, please come. Namaste. Thank you, Shruti, for those kind words. What I'd like to talk about today is how I became involved with this book, Invading the Sacred, an analysis of Hinduism studies in America, and why I think this book matters, not just to me personally, but to us all. I'd like to begin with uh, three short vignettes of how this, how this kind of scholarship has affected me and people like me. When I was in high school, my American history teacher, for no discernible reason, read to the class a newspaper clipping about an airplane that had accidentally landed in a remote Indian coastal village. The article described how the villagers rushed to Garland, the plane, and the pilot. The students and my teacher laughed uproariously at the ignorance of these villagers, or what they mistook to be ignorance, who saw an ordinary airplane and a pilot for, as gods. At that age, I did not have the words or the wherewithal to explain to them that Indians honor anything and anyone that enters their home for the first time. It is customary for Indians to garland honored guests, for example, or to place a dot of vermilion powder on new purchases. This does not mean we regard these objects or persons necessarily as God. Rather, such gestures express our gratitude and respect for them, as well as the divine for bringing them to us. Later on, in college in America, I was exposed to Jeffrey Kripal's theory of Sri Ramakrishna being a homosexual who had homoerotic feelings about and possibly abused Swami Vivekananda. It was presented to me not as speculation, but as an academically established and authoritative truth. All my life, I looked upon Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda as saints who had revived Hinduism during colonial rule in India. I had a picture of Sri Ramakrishna and Sharada Devi to which I daily offered arti, and I eagerly read Swami Vivekananda's complete works. I felt shaken by these academic allegations. Instinctively, I knew such claims were baseless and wrong, but yet these claims were made, by, made and vouched for by authoritative scholars with Ivy League credentials, so they could not be completely wrong, could they? Further on at work in my law practice in New York, I chose to wear a bindi as a mark of auspiciousness. Though some family members and friends warned me that my colleagues may find such a mark to be repugnant or primitive, my belief and experience was that Ameri my fellow Americans were an open-minded people and that I would face no such problems. However, I then came across Professor David Gordon Wright's book, Kiss of the Yogini, Tantric Sex in its South Asian Context, in which he remarks that the bindi, is a represent, the bindi that a Hindu woman wears represents a drop of menstrual blood. At that point, I grew apprehensive, wondering if the bindi would be seen as some primitive, literally bloodthirsty rite. But still, I wear it e every day, even though I do wonder sometimes, when catching the surreptitious, curious stares of others, what exactly they think of it, and whether that perception has been shaped by the speculation of renowned scholars such as Professor White. Because my Indian friends and I have experienced such attitudes towards my religion, usually in the subtlest of ways, and because we have never had the voice or the ammunition with which to fire back to say that these claims are baseless and untruthful, I was delighted to accept the opportunity to become involved with this book. For what starts in American universities does not remain there. It spreads globally, per percolates through to mainstream culture, to primary and secondary schools, and to the way ordinary citizens interact with and react to each other. 
The academic stereotyping of Hinduism as grotesque and over-sexualized harms the serious study of its shastras. The demonology of modern acharyas and gurus embarrasses an entire generation of budding scholars, preventing them to, to, from independently engaging with their works. And when our most cherished deities and traditions are exoticized or sensationalized, we are tempted to abandon those traditions and forms of Hinduism that make us Hindu. I would like to give a few examples of the types of academic misrepresentations that are having this kind of effect. The scholarship being critiqued in this book involves a pattern of Freudian psychoanalyses that sensationalize, eroticize, exoticize, and distort the meanings of sacred Hindu figures, deities, and traditions. Our book analyzes several such case studies, and here are some illustrative examples. This is a quote from Professor Wendy Doniger, Professor of History and Religion at the University of Chicago, past president of, Amer of the American Ac Academy of Religion and Association for Asian Studies, and an award-winning author of numerous books on Hinduism. She has said in her now withdrawn entry in Microsoft and Carta, that Holi, the spring carnival, when members of all castes mingle and let down their hair, sprinkling one another with cascades of red powder and liquid, that was symbolic of the blood that was probably used in past centuries. She has also said that the Bhagavad Gita is not as nice a book as some Americans think. Throughout the Mahabharat, Krishna goads human beings into all sorts of murderous and self-destructive behaviors such as war. In concluding that the Gita is a dishonest book, it justifies war. Then we move on to Jeffrey Kreifel. Professor of Religious Studies and Chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Rice University, who wrote a book which won the Best Book Award from the American Academy of Religion and was listed by Encyclopedia Britannica as its top choice for learning about Sri Ramakrishna. This book claims that the mystical experiences of saints like Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda were the result of sexual abuse and sexual confusion. Here is a direct quote. These homoerotic energies, in other words, not only shaped the symbolism of Ramakrishna's mysticism, they were his mysticism. Let me be very clear. Without the conflicted energies of the saint's homosexual desires, there would have been no Kali sword, no unconscious handmaid, no conflict between the mother and the lover, no child, no Radha, no living lingam, no naked Paramahamsa boys, no Jesus state, no love body, no ecstatically extended feet, no closing and opening doors, no symbolic visions, no pava, and no samadhi. In effect, there would have been no Ramakrishna. Moving on, we go to Professor Paul Courtright, Professor of Religion and Asian Studies and former Chair of the Department of Religion and Asian Studies at Emory University, who wrote a book on Ganesha which won the History of Religions Award. Here are some choice excerpts. Ganesha's trunk is the displaced phallus, a caricature of Shiva's linga. It poses no threat because it is too large, flaccid, and in the wrong place to be useful for sexual purposes. Ganesha remains celibate so as not to compete erotically with his father, who is a notorious womanizer, either incestuously for his mother, Parvati, or for any other woman for that matter. Both in his behavior and iconographic form, <coughs> Ganesha resembles in some aspects the figure of the eunuch. Ganesha is like a eunuch guarding the women of the harem. Let me be very clear. These works are objectionable not because they're grossly offensive, but because they're based on flimsy, unsubstantiated, and often non-existent evidence. Such failings have been pointed out by fellow academics, including both Hindus and non-Hindus, as well as non-Indians, but their challenges have gone completely unanswered and have never been addressed by these scholars. These detailed scholarly critiques, among others, are reprinted or summarized in our book. In order to understand what drives such scholarship, we need to view this phenomenon not as isolated incidents of excess and error, but as part of a larger trend that has spanned many decades and many disciplines. As we show in our book, not much has changed in this field of scholarship from Berkeley Hill's 1921 essay entitled The Anal Erotic Factor in the Religion, Philosophy, and Character of the Hindus, which posited that Hindu reverence for Agni, Indra, and Surya evidenced a fascination for passing gas, as these deities are associated with wind, that Vedic chants emulated the act of passing gas, and that Atman was really a pseudo-metaphysical facade for the Hindu flatus complex. 
This is not just something in the distant past. Today, such a reading is echoed by David Gordon White's reduction of Tantra to an upper caste intellectual whitewash of lower caste sexual practices wherein sacred mantras are nothing more than nonsense syllables from the inart inarticulate moans made, during, made by women during sexual intercourse. This scholarship is not the product of a few idle and perhaps disturbed minds, but rather a narrative driven by deeply embedded civilizational worldviews. Over time, I learned how a coterie of academic scholars is targeting that which is most sacred and renowned in Hinduism. The Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti, Yoga, deities such as Sri Ganesha, Shiva, and Devi, spiritual leaders like Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, and deconstructing them either as being pathological or as not Hindu at all. This is the invasion of the sacred, the looting of a living religion, an entire spiritual and cultural tradition by denigration and by appropriation. Because Hinduism is one of the few remaining major world religions that is non-Abrahamic, and because it is the source of the great traditions of Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism, it is unique, and given the history of similar native religions, one that is under severe attack. Through the invasions of its sacred, both in the physical realm, through the historical colonization of India, and now in the intellectual and cultural realms through ongoing Eurocentric scholarship, its philosophical, cultural, and spiritual capital has been and continues to be destroyed and appropriated. Therefore, we believe that American academic scholarship regarding Hinduism deserves special scrutiny and sensitivity. Our critics falsely claim that we are engaged in censorship. But in fact, we must point out that we do not seek to silence the voices of those critique. We only ask that other voices be added to the ongoing discourse about Hinduism, and therefore we seek to promote multiculturalism and a diversity of view, and not academic censorship. We believe that outsider perspectives do offer value in understanding any religion, including Hinduism, but that emic or insider perspectives are just as vital and valuable. It is our hope that this book will help open up the space and inspire a new generation of thinkers to engage with, question, and interpret with fresh eyes our cultural and religious traditions, to explore how the oldest forms of Indian philosophy can pave new ways of thinking, and to enable us to engage with other traditions and cultures, not through intellectual invasions, but through constructive dialogue and debate. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. I would like to invite Krishnan Ramaswamy, Dr. Krishnan Ramaswamy, and we'll introduce him just before he comes on. <clears throat> Krishnan is a scientist with a background in psychometric research. His areas of work have included clinical outcome trials in major mental illnesses like schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. He is a student of Sanskrit and Vedanta and lives in Staten Island, New York. Namaste. As uh, Aditi mentioned, uh, the, the topic of this book is not just about what's happening in America. Uh, what happens there and what happens in the intellectual climate there <laughs> spreads across the world and definitely has an impact on how India is seen around the world. So what I'll do now is I'll just give you a brief overview of the, what the book is about. Uh, what the book records is how such images of India, the, the kind that Aditi described, how they are produced and how they are propagated. Uh, we uh, place particular emphasis on uh, understanding how the structure of the American academia works and we point out that there are over 8,000 scholars in the American Academy of Religion. So religion is seriously studied as a secular discipline in American universities. Uh, of those 8,000, uh, several hundred study Hinduism and they study other religions in India. So this book looks at the huge academic establishment <coughs> controlled by a dominant culture that produces quite a bit of knowledge about uh, your religion and your culture. The, the, the next thing the book talks about is the recent intellectual challenge to this state of affairs and what happened afterwards. Uh, so in terms of what happened afterwards, we are talking about counterattacks that came from the academic religious studies establishment in America. And I use the word counterattacks advisedly 
because you'll see the nature of these attacks later. Okay, um, we also record in this book the results of this ongoing debate, uh, which gives us, uh, for the first time, I think, uh, a systematic critique of the misrepresentation of Indian traditions that's going on in, in certain sections of the American academia. And the book also serves the purpose of widening the range of ideas and voices in the academy looking at Hinduism. We also hope the book will lead to increased awareness among Indians worldwide, academic scholars and others, and so that there'll be a wider debate about these issues. The book is carved into four separate sections, and I'll uh, just walk you through each one of them briefly. We also have an extensive appendix in the back, which also has some uh, remarkable essays. Um, section one of the book is really uh, a summary of two groundbreaking essays that came out about five years ago, uh, written by uh, Raji Malhotra, in which he surveyed the current status of Hinduism studies in America. And he identified two types of uh, problems um, uh, in, 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 in the in academia. He identified problems with the competence and the training of these scholars in Indian languages and Indian culture. Uh, Bernard Lewis, the, the famous Arabist, says that without uh, deep competence and deep immersion in the language and the culture, a scholar ought not even begin to write. And we find that that's definitely not the case here. Uh, Malhotra also identified what he calls peer review cartels, where a few powerful scholars are able to influence uh, uh, through their uh, ability to reward and their ability to punish. They're able to influence uh, whether in fact books are peer reviewed very thoroughly or not. And that's a very serious problem for academic freedom. He also identified the fact that in the study of Hinduism, psychoanalysis was center stage almost to the exclusion of all other approaches. Now, Alan Rowland, who is a noted psychologist and also is a student of Indian culture, has an essay in this book where he points out that he finds this to be a remarkable trend. It's, it's pretty much only confined to Hinduism where this very center stage position of psychoanalysis is. Uh, using these approaches and using this uh, uh, lack of training uh, and, and, and their, and their uh, you know, cozy relationship with each other, Indian icons, Indian practices uh, are shown to be pathological and destructive. For example, in an introductory textbook on Eastern thought uh, used in many undergraduate uh, schools in America, uh, there's a chapter on Shiva and the chapter on uh, worship in Shiva temples, which makes the claim that uh, these are uh, terrible, dark, strange places and actually goes on to say that Shiva temples were notorious for ritual rape and murder. This is an introductory book. Uh, there are other scholars like Stanley Kurtz, who is quite influential and has many, many people who are taking up his uh, particular scatological approach to understanding India, um, who claims that Hindu mothers do not form a loving emotional partnership with their babies the way that white women do. Now, <laughs> this is, so, but, uh, I do realize that we find this funny, but they find it to be factual. So this is something we should think about. Section two records what happened once these essays came out. The essays came out in a, in a, in a cyber magazine called uh, Suleka.com. Almost 40,000 people downloaded the essay, uh, talk, started talking about it, debating about it. It was as though uh, the, the, uh, a large number of scholars in the world were just waiting for this event to happen. <coughs> We had anthropologists, historians, psychologists starting to write essays analyzing why uh, Malhotra was able to find these biases. They also started looking at some of these texts in greater depth, trying to see if, in fact, the symptoms he had pointed out uh, bore, were borne out. Did they, they go deeper? And in fact, many of them did conclude that they go deeper, and they also published many learned papers about this. Uh, one particular instance that I think is worth mentioning as uh, Aditi already alluded to, uh, Microsoft Encarta had an extensive essay on Hinduism by Wendy Doniger. Now, Encarta is a very influential encyclopedia. Children all over the world use it. You know, school kids use it, college kids use it. You know, quick report for the class, you go to Encarta. Now, 
uh, Sankran Sanu, who's a scholar from Seattle, uh, did a very systematic point-by-point -point comparison of Islam, uh, Christianity, and Hinduism to see how each of these religions is treated in Karta. And his argumentation was so clear and so lucid that Microsoft and Carter actually agreed that there was incredible bias in the Hinduism section, and they actually withdrew it and replaced it with a balanced one. So uh, there are cases where positive engagement with the academia, using their own tools of analysis, actually do bring us uh, great benefits. And so that is really the, uh, the way that this book is shaping up. We really did think at this point that a true chance for change and self-examination seemed at hand, but then you'll see what happened later because we record that also. But before I go to that, I want to give you a couple more examples of the breakdown of the peer review process that we keep talking about. Now, Aditi mentioned this book, uh, Paul Coate writes Ganesha, Lord of Obstacles, uh, won a very major award. Uh, it's been in print for the last 15, uh, 20 years. It was just recently reissued by Oxford University Press. The, uh, the award it won was the History of Religions Award given out by the American Council of Learned Societies, one of the best uh, 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 bodies out there. Now, uh, this book was supposedly peer-reviewed you know, before, it, before, before it got out into the press. But in our book, you'll find an extensive chapter where two scholars named Vishal Agarwal and Kalavai Venkat look at this book very, very carefully and do what peer reviewers are supposed to do. You know, look, check, check facts, uh, check to see whether the theories are sound, check to see whether uh, the conclusions are based on the evidence being presented. And here they find literally dozens of major errors, unverifiable citations, mistranslations, and even what appear to be fabrications. For example, I'm just going to give you two examples. We'll be here all day if I went through uh, this, this entire thing. Cotwright claims, for example, that Hindu scriptures look upon human beings as being God's excrement. And uh, as proof of this, he cites passages from uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam and also from the Linga Purana. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that one can verify, right? So a peer reviewer should go look, look at the, at the uh, references. And that's exactly what Venkat and Agarwal did. They went to the edition of the Bhagavatam quote right use. They went to the Linga Purana edition he used. They went to other critical editions of the book. No such passage, right? The Purana says God uh, that human beings are born from the manas of uh, the universe uh, of the of the Lord uh, of the universe personified as God. So where does quote right get this from? There's a clue because apart from listing the Linga Purana and the Bhagavata Purana as his references, he also lists Wendy Doniger's work. And it turns out that all he really did was perpetuate a mistake, uh, uh, an invention that Wendy Doniger had come up with earlier. Next, um, Cotright claims that the Devi Bhagavatam records an incestuous rape of the goddess Sati by Daksha Prajapati. Now, this, if it got, came across the desk of any peer-reviewing scholar, should be a bit of a bombshell, right? I mean, when you see a major claim like that made, you'd imagine that one would scurry to the library and check up the references and make sure this is actually passing muster. But apparently that was not done. And so when you look at the Devi Bhagavata Purana, uh, which uh, Venkat and uh, Agaval have done, there is no such passage in the Purana. I want you to think about what this means. Uh, such a major claim is made, the peer reviewers are not even activated to make sure that it's accurate. To my mind, it suggests a pervasive atmosphere where it's believed that we Indians, we Hindus, are pretty weird and pretty much anything is possible with us. So it's not worth fact-checking. Um, just another one, another example of claims uh, that, that we've uh, exposed in this book. Uh, Berkeley Hill uh, in 1921 uh, published an essay also on Kali, apart from the flattest complex one, where he talked about uh, how uh, Kali was the uh, bloodthirsty, menstruating, castrating woman, and you know uh, this really shows the sexual insecurity of Indian men and so on and so forth. That was back in 1921. Uh, here we have Sarah Caldwell uh, in the 1980s uh, publishing a book saying, Kali is first of all a phallic being, mother with a penis, she's a bloody image of the castrating and menstruating, thus castrating female. Nice circular analysis there. This type of analysis, the phallic abilities of the goddess disguise castration anxieties, ultimately directed towards the father, as well as homosexual desire for the father's penis. Now, 
um, this they will tell you is well you know it's it's arcane analysis and we really are only using it in some uh, uh, textbooks that really nobody but scholars read so it's not really going to affect how people think about hindus and about hindu goddesses and so on and so forth well in 2007 january of this year wendy doniger writes a nice essay in washington post uh, talking about why white women should stay away from the hindu goddess this is the theme of the uh, of the of the essay and she says nor are these goddesses by and large compassionate they are generally a bloody uh, pretty bloodthirsty lot goddesses are not the solution to stay away from them so we, what we see here is that the academic establishment manufactures a certain reality of its own then that permeates and they in fact push it out into the public and uh, environment <laughs> sections 3 and 4 actually record like i said what happened when uh, malhotra essay came out then all the other scholarly responses which deepened and 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 strengthened his arguments came out you would expect at this point that the academic establishment would say my god what have we been doing how have we been allowing works like this to get out works that are not based on fact works that are based on people who are untrained in psychoanalysis spewing whatever pop psychology that even cosmopolitan mag- magazine would be ha- uh, embarrassed to print why are we letting this happen but that's really not what happened i mean i i was actually shocked because i was watching these events unfold and it was actually very shocking to see mm-hmm. what they did and we have stunning documentation in this book of what the academia did it was basically a circle the wagons approach keep out the savages and use all kinds of ad hominem attacks do not address any of the substantive arguments they raise okay because that fail is failure for us so let's just demonize them wish them out of the way and we'll be fine <coughs> every critic including reputed scholars like uh, jacob de ru or s n balagangadhara even antonio de nicolas uh, one of the gentlest human beings i know were were attacked as being agents of the hindu right um uh, not only this the, the us scholars then managed to go to the us media and stories started appearing in the washington post in the uh, new york times and so on and so forth linking uh the the scholarly criticism that was taking place in the US with events in India so this was a time for example when uh, you know a bunch of fanatics went and burned the bandharkar institute uh, over the lane controversy so suddenly uh, the, the scholars around the world who were criticizing the american academia were now being linked to the the burning of the bandharkar institute and and to the de- death threats and so on and so forth so this um, is uh, another important record that this book provides of how um there were some voices trying to restore the debate there were some voices trying to restore sanity but by and large uh, the academia demonstrated this very very strange herd mentality <clears throat> by by they were trying to block debate so that uh, in 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 a, in a nutshell is what our book is about uh, and um, you will see that everything that we are saying is uh, uh, referenced footnoted very carefully checked and we'll stand by it and we hope that what this will do is really generate debate we hope that it will it'll really inspire more and more indian scholars to stand up and start questioning what the west has made of us thank you i would now request our chief guest dr kapila vatsayan to please launch the book for us uh, aditi and krishnan would you please help dr vatsayan Might as well be crazy now. Now, just take this book and give it to me, and besides being an expert besides being an insider in the academy she is also so kind and magnanimous to be here at such short notice and we are really grateful to you dr doshi and uh, we would like you to now launch the book for us and also speak a few words
Uh, please notice we've tied it the Indic way. We haven't tied it with paper which you have to tear. <laughs> That's cloth. <laughs> Friends, yesterday evening, Shruti called me and she asked me if I'd received this invitation to come, which I had earlier in the morning. And then she asked me if I would be so kind as to speak, and which was really for me a little <clears throat> short notice in the sense I really didn't know what the book was until she sent the book to me and the clippings. But in general, what the subject was, was of great interest to me because as a person who's been in uh, academics, also as a person who's been with museums and publishing, I have encountered certain attitudes that I felt a sort of conformed or were in conformity with what I have been hearing from the two editors. Actually, we, I mean, I'm a trained art historian and as an art historian, we have felt that uh, the history of Indian art is greatly influenced by what the West thinks of it. The Western scholars, interestingly, and I'm just citing certain facts, would come to India because scholarships were available in the field. They were not really very interested in it, but because there was a scholarship available, they would come here. They would come here. They don't generally know our culture very well. They don't understand our languages. Certainly, they've taken a course here or there and uh, can speak uh, little bit of possible Hindi or understand a little more Sanskrit but uh, really when they come to India the Indians I mean it's much too overpowering an image for them they come here they live here and half of them I would say just because they have to stay in certain places you know sometimes they're because Indian art and culture is at places like Banaras or in uh, certain villages where they're conducting their research, researches. When they come to Bombay, their exclamation is, ah, civilization. So what I'm trying to say is there is, what you all have been noticing and commenting upon is there is an inbuilt bias. That civilization is only when you come to a city like Bombay, which is a modern metropolis with roads and uh, tall buildings and an infrastructure which corresponds to what they are used to. Then it's civilization, otherwise it is not. I mean, the fact that you have such an ancient civilization doesn't really matter. So these are the things. And you see this sort of, uh, we had uh, about 10 years ago commented on this that, you know, the Americans find that there, as far as, I'm only talking of Indian art and culture, but I'm sure that represents what we all must be noticing in our own disciplines. The fact is that they come here because they find that they have exhausted quite a lot of, uh, lot of work in their own fields, in their own countries. You know, if they're studying uh, you know, European art history, maybe there's nothing very much left on Rembrandt to do. But when they come to India, they have this Wild West, I'm talking to the Americans, Wild West uh, mentality. Ah, we are on the frontiers of knowledge. We, there are only two or three books on this subject and we can bring, what we will bring out will be the authoritative version on that subject. Well, it's wonderful to have someone with the excitement to come and want to do pioneering research. But the idea you get is it's not that it's their interest. It's the money that is being given to them and the cherry is ripe for picking. So come. This is, this is some of the attitudes. I must say that a lot of work that has been done by them has been extremely innovative, it's a new way of looking at it. We Indian scholars, me particularly, I would say, is I'm totally indebted to my American education in art history. 
I feel that it has equipped me to deal with the Americans or the Westerners on their own ground, in their own manner. And unfortunately, our own scholars do not try to match that. Maybe our teaching institutions don't teach it. Whatever it is, they've cut such poor figures in international seminars. Their knowledge may be profound, but they're not in a position to, uh, to present it. So we already start with a disadvantage. Then most Indian scholars are so thrilled or so overawed by the fact that a foreigner is interested in whatever work they're doing that they're very, very keen on giving their knowledge. I mean, it is pathetic at the way in which we behave. And, and you know, they're, they're looking for little handouts, our scholars, which is sad. Why should they be in that position? You know, a trip abroad, or if I will be invited, then I will give you this and maybe you can get me there for two months or so. It's, it's sad and you know, I feel sorry that we in this country are first and foremost neglecting our own heritage because it's not properly taught in schools. Yesterday I was sitting with my grandson to do his, help him with his history for his history examination. And the sort of irrelevant details that the child is supposed to learn is just amazing. There's no need for that. They don't give a, a, a sort of outline and an interesting way of looking at it. They give you little things to remember which, which you know, a child will mug up and forget immediately. So we ourselves are to blame at the way we have structured our education. We ourselves are to blame with the way that our scholars are not equipped. Why is it not possible for us to have an Academy of Indian Art and Culture where scholars would be taught how to present their images? They have poor slides. We never used to have good photographs in the earlier years. Today with good uh, digital for cameras and all things have changed. But you know, I as a student and as a scholar used to, when I came home from my trips abroad, I wasn't bringing things that are interesting for most people. What was I bringing? I was bringing films. And my refrigerator used to be filled with films because they were unavailable here. So we uh, as scholars also work, and I am talking about a person who had the wherewithal to buy films and all. It wasn't that I was not like some poor scholar, I had the wherewithal. I could afford to buy it, but it was not available here. At the airport, all I would be doing is taking 20, 30 rolls of film to bring here, and then you would be so chintzy with your photographs, because you couldn't waste film, you couldn't do so many things. So, Earlier these were the situations, but hopefully things will change now. But <clears throat> apart from the general scenario, the whole thing is that we ourselves look, uh, show lack of confidence. About 20 years ago, I was invited to a Greek seminar, a, a seminar in Greece on contemporary art. And what was the seminar? It was an international seminar. Who were the people at it? Most of it was people from Europe and America, noted critics. Then there was a Persian painter who lived in Paris. There was a Kuwaiti painter who lived in Paris. There was me and there was one Chinese scholar who couldn't speak a word of English. Chinese painter. He was a, uh, an orthodox painter in the Chinese ancient style. So this is the representation. In the representation, when I showed our modern art, all of them started sniggering. And what was the reason? Oh, it's so derivative. It has nothing inventive to say. It has nothing new to say. And um, some of the people got up and left, you know, showing no interest. So later on, because we were all together in that seminar, we would all have lunch together. It was amazing. It was these established scholars, people like Lucy Smith, who was a known English critic. But the younger people came. They said, we found it very interesting. You know, we could see that you have a different style of painting. And I said, yes, because, you know, we are an old culture. And we, it is a continuation in a different way, in a different era, but it's a continuation of our own thinking. 
Of course, they didn't believe it. And when Lucy Smith was chatting with me later on, he said to me, you know, your country has not progressed beyond craft. Because all you, I was showing some paintings of Somnath Hor, where he takes paper pulp and he uses, uses it on paper to talk about, um, you know, it's, it's a series called Wounds. And these were the sort of wounds, you know, sort of bloodless wounds he was trying to show about people. And I thought it was such a um, trenchant statement he was making through these things. And he, this man just reduced it to craft paper pulp on paper. What is it? He said, you know, your country has much to progress. He says, your country is like Greece. You all have a superb ancient civilization, but you have nothing as far as modernity is concerned. And the same thing I encountered once in a book I sent to a scholar I met in uh, USA and he was very kind to me and I thought the, uh, as, a, as a gift I sent him a book I'd written. He was at that time writing something and it was a book on Ranakpur, one of the temples, giant temples. This man was writing on, I forget now the complete uh, subject, but was on how writing on art is done. And he took my book and he trashed it. He says, you know, I get more to understand about this religion from a Western scholar who has written on it from a person who has, from Dr. Doshi. Now, here I am, I live in India. I am a practicing Jain. I know a lot. I have studied Jain art for 30 years. And I can't write properly, whereas a person who is American can write better. But the thing then, as I was talking to my husband, he says, Saryu, in this case it is that Chatterjee understands what Banerjee says. So it is like they only understand each other, they don't understand anyone else. So we have to just accept it as that. So these are the sort of prejudices and uh, that one encounters in this field. But having said that, let me tell you that I have some wonderful friends, all of them who have been extremely helpful acad in academic work, in doing my research, in inviting me to lecture, in having me over. So these are a few examples. But what I'm trying to suggest to you is that not the, I'm not saying all of them are like that, but certainly there are underpinnings of such attitudes which you which surface, at least in my case, have surfaced now and again, and I have been very deeply, what shall I say, I felt it sort of shatters you, because they are your friends, you respect them, you look up to them, you admire their writing, you admire the way they conduct themselves, and then you feel that they can be so petty and so trite in certain things. So I would just say that this is a wonderful movement that has started. I think it is important that we bring it to their notice. Maybe they're doing it unconsciously. Maybe it's a, it's a sort of worldview which they have inherited and with which they approach everything as being the best being the best. Uh, just to give you an example, the thing is, as I told you about modern art, how it was trashed at that international seminar, Today, we Indians have become economically more powerful. We Indians have established a presence in America. The diaspora has become a thing to reckon with. And therefore, today you find Indian modern art commanding a presence in all the auctions abroad. The prices are now beginning to match the prices abroad, of art abroad, Western art. And the fact that we are now interested our, in our own culture, that we respect it enough to spend large sums of money on it, is attracting Western scholarship. Western scholars are coming out to India to study contemporary Indian art. Twenty years ago, it was trashed as being nothing. So I think it is we. We, with our own self-confidence, with our own attitude towards ourselves, with our own, you know, pride in our own culture, we will be able to counter this also 
apart from books like this, but we ourselves are important in getting a different point of view aroused in people. With that, I thank you all. And May I please invite all the panelists to the dais? We have a very illustrious panel with us today, and we are really honored. I'll start from the extreme left. We have Rajiv Malhotra, Sri V. Balachandran, the president of Indo-American Society, Dr. Saryu Doshi in the middle, Professor Arvind Sharma, He's written the preface of the book, and it's one of the most brilliant prefaces I've ever read. It gives you the picture so clearly. And one more thing I'd like to mention before we go on is the person who replaced Wendy Doniger in Microsoft Encarta was him. So. <clears throat> so I have one less friend in the world. <laughs> and then we have uh, Ajit Gulabchand. So I'm going to request uh, Professor Sharma to speak his thoughts on this, and I'd just like to introduce him before that. Professor Sharma started out as an IAS officer in India. So he's understood the Indian government as well. He's been in India, and only after that did he move to, the, uh, to Canada and the US, and he's uh, the Burke's Professor of Comparative Religion in the Faculty of Religious Studies, McGill University, Montreal, Canada, and has published extensively in the field of rel uh, religious uh, studies and is currently engaged in promoting the adoption of a universal declaration of human rights by the world's religions. It's a very important movement. Uh, since uh, Rupa has published this book. Uh, I'd like to mention that there are some more publications of Professor Sharma's uh, uh, books by Rupa. One of them is called Hindu Egalitarianism, and the other forthcoming book is The Philosophy of Religion, A Sikh Perspective. So, Professor Sharma, I'd request you to speak. Okay, thank you, Shruti. Okay. Now, in the time I have, I would like to make four points to highlight the significance of this book. The first point is historical in nature and the others more contemporary in their orientation. The global reality today is marked by the presence of different civilizations in different parts of the globe, as exemplified by the Japanese and Chinese civilizations in the East, the Islamic in the Middle East and elsewhere, the Western in Europe, North America, Australia and New Zealand, and so on. Now, Indian civilization also belongs to this club. One salient fact, however, distinguishes Indian civilization from these. The present self-understanding of each of these major civilizations is based, by and large, on the work of scholars who belonged to these civilizations. But such self-understanding as the Indian civilization possesses today is the result, in the main, of the work of Western scholars rather than its own. This striking fact sets Indian civilization apart from other civilizations. If the self-understanding of one civilization is thus mediated through another, then the question naturally arises, to what extent does the work of the scholars belonging to another civilization correctly reflect the assumptions of the civilization they are writing about. For instance, 
non-Muslims writing about Islam may not accept the Quran as the literal word of God. Not, a metaf not in a metaphorical sense, a literal word of God, which is a foundational Islamic belief. To the extent that they do not do so, their presentation of the civilization, of which it is a central text, will reflect their own views about Islamic civilization rather than the civilization's own view about itself. If therefore, future members of Islamic civilization relied on the work of non-Muslims for gaining their own understanding of Islamic civilization, their self-understanding of their own civilization will have deviated from what it would have been had it not been mediated in this manner. So a unique question now arises in the case of Indian civilization. In a way, it does not arise, at least to that extent, in the context of other civilizations. That its foundational self-understanding has been affected by the intellectual intervention of another civilization. If Indian civilization wants to form a correct conception of its true identity, then there is no escaping this fact. This book highlights this issue by indicating how widely the Western interpretation can diverge from the indigenous when the psychoanalytic lens is applied to the study of Hinduism and raises the larger issue, to what extent has our self-understanding of our religion, our history, and our culture been mediated by Western assumptions? There is no suggestion here that Western scholarship in general necessarily <coughs> misrepresents Indian civilization. There is the assumption, however, that this could have happened consciously or unconsciously. This book provides evidence that this has, or this can credibly be said to have happened in the cases covered in the book. If this is so, then it becomes one's intellectual duty to identify where else this might have happened, and why, and with what consequences. It is only after such an exercise has been thoroughly carried out that members of Indian civilization can place due confidence in the scholarly representation of their own identity. This was the first point, and one I think of fundamental significance. The second point has to do with the fact that we are living in a secular age, but that but that this reality might be changing. Ever since the Enlightenment, it has been an underlying assumption of Western, and by extension, global intellectual life, that religion is a receding force in human affairs, and was destined to either disappear altogether, as in many versions of Marxist thought, or at the very least, to disappear from public life and become a purely private affair, as visualized by the Western liberal tradition. This secular hypothesis had an air of inevitability about it until 1979, when the Iranian Revolution occurred. That, too, could be dismissed as an aberration. But since then, the level of fundamentalism has risen in virtually all the religions of the world, a fact only dramatized by the events of September 11, 2001. One is therefore compelled to ask the question, is the long-term historical glow towards secularism defined here as the exclusion of religion from public life, is this trend in the process of reversing itself? If such is the case, 
Then a host of incidents like the Danish cartoon controversy, the hijab controversy, the Ten Commandments controversy in the USA, and so on, start appearing in a new light as constituting the negotiation of the terms of the re-entry of religion into the public square. And one such term being that religions will challenge their secular rejection or denigration, especially in the media and even in the academia. If this view possesses any merit, then this book could be seen as a Hindu manifestation of this evolving phenomenon. The third point is connected to the second. It was axiomatically assumed until recently, and often still is, that progress around the world consisted in its becoming an image of the West as far as possible. Or to put it dramatically, Europe's past is the world's future. Europe's past is the world's future. Just as Europe had undergone secularization, so will the rest of the world, if, and this is a big if, if, however, the secular trend has reversed, then the world will have to learn to accommodate religions in the public square, of which the West has little experience. One major way in which the West has tried to deal with religious differences is by not dealing with them, by eliminating them from the public square. But if the secular trend has reversed, then the West cannot be of much help anymore in the way it was. One may have to look to Asia, which has had a far more successful record historically of dealing with religious pluralism in the public square. This could be said to be the case for pre-British India, for pre-communist China, and for Japan all along. Thus, if the secular trend has reversed, and the reversal is not going to reverse itself anytime soon, then arguably, Asia's past is the world's future. One is, of course, always free to choose the direction of one's research. But if such might be the case, then the priorities of Western scholarship, as represented in this book, pose something of a puzzle. For then, what would seem relevant about Ramakrishna is not whether he was a latent homosexual, or by extension, that Mahatma Gandhi may have been a latent heterosexual, <laughs> but what their life and teachings have to offer for dealing with religious pluralism in the public square. My final point is very different in nature from <coughs> the previous two points, though not unrelated to them. In this age of human rights discourse, one needs to raise the following question. Academics and the media have their rights, but do the followers of the religions have some rights of their own when it comes to their depiction in the media and the academia? This issue is implicit in the book and can no longer be neglected. A global congress on world religions after September 11 met in Montreal from September 11 to 15 <coughs> last year. At this Congress, Madame Shirin Ibadi of Iran, Nobel Peace Laureate for 2003, released a document entitled, A Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the World's Religions, for discussion in the academic and faith communities around the world. This document has been in evolution since 1998, and has been discussed at several conferences and has generated considerable interest. It is available on the internet. It is supported by several individuals and associations 
and the project has been endorsed by four other Nobel Peace Laureates, apart from Madam Shirin Ibadi, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, Bishop Bello of Timor Leste, and Professor Eli Wiesel of Israel. This draft document contains the following provisions. Article 12, Clause 4. Everyone has the right not to have one's religion denigrated in the media or the academia. Clause 5. It is the duty of the follower of every religion to ensure that no religion is denigrated in the media or the academia. The book acquired a special significance in the light of these clauses. This is all that I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharma. That was very revealing. And I think we have a lot to think about and act upon it. I'd now like to invite Sri V. Balachandran, and I'll just introduce him briefly. He was an MA from Loyola College, Chennai. He was in the Indian Police Service in 1959 and the, in the Maharashtra cadre of IPS. He joined the Cabinet Secretariat as the minister uh, in, uh, in the Embassy of India in uh, Washington, DC. And he retired as the Special Secretary uh, uh, of the Cabinet Secretariat in 1995, and today he is the President of the Indo-American Society, and he writes on current subjects in the mainstream newspapers today, and we are extremely honored that you're here with us. And he's also writing an article for this book, which will come out shortly in the next few days in the Asian Age, so please look out for it. Dr. Sari Joshi and uh, distinguished members of the panel, let me caution you that I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a historian, I'm a, a policeman come bureaucrat. So if my presentation is not uh, up to the mark, please do excuse me. I shall try to tackle this particular problem from a different angle. Uh, last month, we received a, a delegation of the White House Fellows as you know, White House Fellows are the, the future leaders of the United States. General uh, Colin Powell was a White House Fellow. They are picked up from different walks of uh, life, including the government, private sector and all that, and then given an intensive training for one year. Uh, there is a White House Fellows Commission. I gave a presentation to them about the history of Indo-American relations. Uh, so that particular research that I did came very handy while giving this brief introduction. Dr. Krishnan made a brief mention about this misunderstanding about India had affected the US foreign policy. I shall give some more details about it. In 1976, Asia Society conducted a survey of the textbooks in American schools. They appointed uh, 103 experts who reviewed 306 books used in 50 states. And the result was that India received the most negative uh, attention in all the textbooks of all the Asian states. So uh, another scholar called John W. Miller, author of India, A Rising Middle Power, he said that US policy towards India was the product of similar stereotypes. The, the portrayal was that it is, it, it is nothing but diseases, illiteracy, etc., etc. And India was portrayed as poverty-stricken and helpless, since American legislators and decision-makers were subject to the same impressions. And I'll quote another uh, survey done by the U.S. State Department, Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs in 1982, they found that American attitudes about India, more than about any other place, focus on disease, death, and illiteracy. So the subject that of this particular book today, looking from a different perspective of 
government policy has an important bearing. Uh, I was minister in the Indian Embassy Washington for nearly four years. I had very close interaction with the Indian families all over the United States. I could find that the, the children are totally confused because of this very wrong picture about, and of course today we, had, we were given only a, an example of what happens in the universities, but if you really go into the textbooks it is still worse. They are very confused. They do not publicly acknowledge that they belong to a, a religion, Hindu religion. So if these are the future generations, the, the first or second generation Americans, Indian Americans who are growing up in the United States. So they start with a complex. Now I'll quote another scholar, Yvette Rosa. In fact, her article is there in this book. She had written in 2001. Stereotypes, uh, she had written an uh, internet uh, uh, article in uh, winter 2001, Teaching South Asia an Internet Journal of Pedagogy. Stereotypes about India and Hinduism when taught as fact in American classrooms may negatively impact students of South Asian origin who are struggling to work out their identity in a multicultural, predominantly Anglo-Christian environment. Now this, in a nutshell, is the problem that we are facing now. Much of the book is, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant article, I must say, I must really compliment all of them, Mr. Malhotra and all, Dr. Krishna and all of this, for bringing out this book. But I, it is my submission that something more needs to be done. It's not just enough that we indulge in a, a, in a, in a debate at the very scholastic level. Something more needs to be done to change the outlook. How is it that after 1990, the U.S. business attitude towards India, the government attitudes in India has undergone a sea change? Why is it that it's not there in the, in, the, in the universities? And when they can dish out this type of nonsense about our religion, it is, it is something more needs to be done. Now, at this juncture, I may also support what uh, Mr. Malhotra had said this, that there's a very prosperous Indian community there, I'll just re uh, read out some statistics. The annual buying power of Indian Americans is two, $20 billion annually. There are 1,000 Indian American organizations. I know most of these uh, top leaders of the Indian organization there. Asian American Hotel Owners Association, they, there are 4,000 members. They own 12,500 hotels in the United States. Total market value is $31 billion. Mr. Malhotra had said that, that our Indian American leadership, they are content in building temples, but leaving this type of things to the tender mercies of the, the, the so-called uh, experts in the different universities. Now, can't we marshal the strength of the Indian Americans and do some, some sort of an action? I'll quote one example, how a concerted move through the law, uh, legal system was able to turn the tide in California. In 2005, the Christian, Hindu, Jewish and Muslim groups complained to the California State Board of Education that their religions were negatively portrayed in some textbooks. The board was in a mood to make the changes proposed by the Hindu groups. This I owe uh, this particular information to Dr. Krishnan. But they reversed the stand when Professor Bitzel, a Harvard Sanskrit professor, due to certain motivated reasons, wrote to them saying that no change is required. As a result of this, the Hindu groups took the California Board of Education to the court and in 2006 they won the case and the part of the expenses are to be paid by the California Board of Education to the litigants. Unfortunately, their second demand that the textbook should be scrapped was not accepted, but in this year, the consultation with the affected people has already started from March onwards. Now, whenever you see such a thing, whenever you see such a distortion of the religion, of our culture, the Indian Association should take it up with the, uh, uh, with the law courts. Now, in this respect, 
uh, I may again quote one example of the Jewish groups. The Jewish groups were also subjected to such discrimination and uh, total distortion of the history of the culture and everything. So finally, the organization called Banai Brith set up what is called Anti-Defamation League. And they started, there is a website, some of uh, the top people are, I know them very well. There is a, a director of international relations called Daniel Mariashan, who has got an Indian wife. They do a proactive, uh, you know, agitation. Wh when it comes to a question of when the Jewish religion is portrayed badly, they take, they take recourse to the writing the media, they confront the people concerned, they go to the court, and if it fails, they go into direct action like demonstrations. Now, from the website one could see that in 2006, there were 1,554 incidents involving the religion. And it was down by 12%. 12, 12 and they keep an audit of all these uh, incidents. So my submission to the, uh, to the Indian Americans in USA is that they should emulate this example. They have become assertive, they are financially powerful. If this type of negative portrayals are done, they should emulate the example of anti-defamation league. And they attack the anti-Semitism on the campus. We should also do that. Otherwise, this particular book is a, is a trendsetter, is one of the, uh, you know, good beginnings. But I think something more needs to be done. That's all my, thank you. I would now like to invite uh, Sri Ajit Gulabchand to give us his thoughts, which I'm sure will be quite assertive from the few instances I've had in my uh, engagement with him once over the phone and once meeting him before this. And he's very vocal, very strong, very articulate in his views and look forward to hearing what he has to say. <clears throat> so, I would like to introduce him now. He is the Chairman and Managing Director of Hindustan Construction Company Limited. And this is the largest heavy civil engineering and construction company in India. He is the President of the Con uh, Construction Federation of India and the National Council Member of the CII, the Confederation of Indian Industry. He is the chairman and main sponsor of the National Institute of Construction Management. You are the chairman of the Balchand College of Engineering. And he's done considerable work in disaster management and AIDS awareness. So, Ajit ji, we look forward to your thoughts. I'm not here for my scholarship or expertise either on the subject or on the issues of religion. However, the book invoked in me an extraordinary response, that is, the arrival of the new confident Indian that is now looking after his own destiny, which otherwise was left to many others to do. And in this context, this book does an exemplary work in bringing forth what Indians feel about the, their own religions. However, I do have some differences with a possible approach on how we should deal with this in future, particularly because we need not confuse Hinduism as a religion in the same genre as the Semitic religions. The Semitic religions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity are all faith-based religions, which are basically based on received wisdom. And two of them also engage in proselytizing and, in fact, have a mandate to do so. While Christianity may have somewhat fallen behind or changed its approach uh, over the last few hundred years, Islam continues to be a strong proselytizing religion as demanded by its fundamentals. 
Whereas we on the other side in the Indic religions have truly believed in an element of pluralism. Why not element? Basically in pluralism where we live with each other and look at religion as dharma which is unfortunately the closest word found. Mazhab and dharma are two very different things. Uh, religion as we understand is faith based and, it's, and it is not necessarily, it's basically a belief that everybody together must follow, whereas dharma is a nature of things and therefore the entire basis of our way of looking at life is truth, is a matter of experience, not belief. And from this stems a respect for what other people do and do not do. This has been my understanding of the Indic religions or Indic dharmas or the Indic way of looking at life. So whilst we may draw our inspiration from the past of what we are and what kind of philosophy we represent, uh, we unfortunately have lost it. We cannot resurrect it by the same old ways. We will have to rethink it and this book is one way of beginning that, the new beginning of doing our own scholarship. So in this context, when we look at it, I personally find it very difficult that we would be really I, to see a world which is moving back towards religion and that would be a disaster. The reason is that while religion is important for everybody, it still must remain in the private domain. The moment it becomes in public domain, the right, the pluralism would vanish. Because when you get a faith-based religion demanding that this is the only God, then you do have a problem. Or this is the only way of doing things, then you have a problem. Then there is no debate. There is no dissent. And all over the world, wherever we have seen democracy, where dissent exists, where we have removed religion from, from public domain, we have been able to establish scholarship. We have been able to establish a variety of things that have allowed us to grow. We have, in fact, allowed entrepreneurship to come in only because we do not have those possibilities of a fixed, rigid system of doing things. And in this context, I believe that Hinduism, with its pluralistic attitude towards it, has something to tell the world and something. And in this context, we need to present our way of doing things, our, our religion, to the world in the light that it is. And that a lot of these mythical features of our religion are basically metaphors to explain life. And they are only to be considered in that context. And when we look at it that way, you suddenly find a lot more meaningful understanding of whatever we are going to do, rather than take God and some of the things literally. And therefore, well, for one, for a, for a simple example, like the, the, the killing of, uh, and, uh, of uh, Mm, uh, which is uh, Durga, the, the, the Rakshas, who, whose blood used to be, Mahishas, whose blood, if spilled to the ground, would create another Rakshas. So Rakhita. he had. Huh? Rakhita yes. And Raktabich. And then the only way to kill him was in the mouth so that the blood does not spill to the ground. Now that's how you'll have to kill Osama bin Laden if you don't want that horror to spread. Now, these are some of the metaphors that allow us to understand life and tell us the direction in which we go. And it is through this process, as I understand it, is that Indian, Indic religions have something to offer to the solutions in how to live in a pluralistic society with respect towards each other. And this is not easily possible because you have faith-based religions that are not willing to look at it. The only way they can look at it if religion goes back into the, into the private realm and not come out in the public domain. And this is one of the real reasons why our friend is looking for a human rights, common human rights charter by religions. I find the exclusion of Islam in it because none of the Islamic countries in the world have actually signed the human rights charter of the United Nations. And therefore there is a conflict, but is it a conflict between between all religions? Or is it a conflict that we, who are now coming into our own, are facing? So if you have to confront the West, I think we should not describe the West by the likes of uh, the Doniger lady. 
she's a few of those. And there is, of course, a small bias. But by and large, the West has allowed thought to progress. And all of this debate is in the realm of Western, Western uh, uh, universities. When is this debate going to take place in uni Indian universities? We have derided our own practices, customs, as religious and therefore out of the realm of any kind of study. No Vedic studies are carried out in our colleges. There's no discussion and debate on this because it's all grouped under religion, which it is not. Most of it, the Hindu law is not religious. It is a law of the land. It's a common law. But it is still derided as a, as a Hindu law and therefore religious, which it isn't. But as Islamic law, Christian laws, a number of them are religious. However, having looked at it that way, we need to understand for ourselves that our problem is not in the West. Our problem is with ourselves. We ourselves are not able to sit up and debate these issues confidently, confront our past confidently. Why have we not been able to, to look at ourselves with that? Now with the coming of an, some element of prosperity, and as prosperity spells, we hope that we will have the necessary wealth in order to spend on generating that irradiation amongst our universities and scholars so that we can create material that can be presented to the world for it to analyze and for it to stand the best analysis and best critique by anywhere else in the world. I think that would be the course I'd rather follow because West, to my mind, is, is not so bad because we have a, it's very easy to sit back and be very anti-American. It catches like fire. And then finally, nobody wishes to go to Saudi Arabia for a holiday, or for that matter, to Tehran. Everybody's rushing to Europe, and everybody's rushing to send their children to American universities. So I think, hey, let us understand that we have some oneness with free societies. We are a free society. We should become freer. And amongst the free societies of the world, we probably rank the lowest. But having said that, we are there, and we can improve. And with new found prosperity, new scholarship, and the new confidence that Indians have found, I look forward to a period in which we create erudition in India, a respect for scholarship in India, and the requisite study, not just some kind of a, a, a polemic, but, but a serious study that stands up to scrutiny by any scholars in the world, that is what would create the impression on Western universities and Western scholars. And this is why I like the book, that it's beginning, that it does not address the issue by going in and, and, and breaking away uh, Doniger's office, but actually taking her, 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 her uh, studies apart, paragraph by paragraph, on the basis of facts and analysis. And I think this is exactly what we need. But not necessarily in only countering what has been written, but creating for ourselves a better understanding of who we are and who we were, so that we can create a future for our children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajitji. I would now like to invite Yes, sure. We have very little hope if our president is going to be talking to dead people to convince the West <laughs> we are very sane. Well, we wouldn't have been having this discussion had it not been for the pioneering work of Rajiv Malhotra. He's had threats to his life in the last five years because of his first exposure of this uh, issue. He's learned to uh, absorb fear because there's no point being fearful when you take on a challenge like that. So he was a corporate executive and then a successful entrepreneur in telecom and lived in the USA for 36 years. Upon taking early retirement at the age of 45, when he felt he had to give back to the community what it had given to him from childhood, <clears throat> he founded the Infinity Foundation to pursue research on India-related issues. So the first uh, idea of the Infinity Foundation was compassion and wisdom. And 
as he went along, he, he found these very serious issues coming up, so he took up more research on many issues. Over the past 12 years, Infinity has funded over 250 projects. Uh, Rajiv Ji is also a prolific writer on the internet and is now known as a serious public intellectual. Rajiv Ji. Thank you. I have a few points I want to make to uh, seed the discussion that I hope will happen afterwards. First of all, the work behind what has been published in the book does not claim to describe all Americans. For instance, even in the, in the academic world, the business schools are very pro-India. The business schools, which is a new phenomenon in the last 10 years since the investment climate in India is doing well and corporate America is very pro-India. So what they're teaching in the MBAs is very much a story favorable to India. The book talks about another department or another collection of departments which are social sciences and humanities. Uh, this includes South Asian studies, religious studies, history, uh, anthropology, those kind of things, which are following the same trend as they did, as if nothing has happened in the last 10 years to change them. They're still the old guard since the Cold War, that type of attitude towards India. So we have to differentiate between what is being criticized and the rest of America. Also, a lot of popular culture in America is very pro-Indian culture, religion, symbols, yoga, meditation, all these kinds of things. Uh, so the, 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 gr the group of people that are focused on the study of India in the United States is roughly about 2,000. 2000, there's 2,000 professionals, full-time, career, India studies. And they are in these different departments. And this number is increasing rapidly because people are being added into business schools and think tanks and so on because India is important to study. So at this rate, this number will probably double in the next uh, few years. Now I have, for the last 10 years, uh, used my uh, business experience and professional experience to study the, these 2,000 people as an industry. So this is what I want to um, mention. I think particularly Ajit on the panel would <laughs> relate to that because as a business person, you first look at an industry you're operating in. You cannot take isolated individuals. And when you look at an industry, you look at who are the producers, who are the distributors, who are the retailers. So I figured that the classrooms are retailers of India knowledge. The media are retailers, they're not producing the research themselves, uh, and so forth. The producers of knowledge are in higher education. They are in places like Harvard and Chicago and places like that. They are the, the, uh, the advanced scholars. Uh, and, and so I wanted to study the industry producers of knowledge and also look at the distribution channels to see if these distribution channels are controlled by a few guardians who only let certain products through. Like in Walmart in America, if they have more than 50% market share of shoes or clothes, no matter what you produce, if Walmart won't carry it, you will not be as successful as your competitor who got into Walmart. So the control of distribution channels can control who gets to produce. You can produce all the knowledge you want. Ajit ji is right, we can produce all kinds of knowledge you want. But if you cannot get it through the journals, it is not legitimate knowledge. If you cannot get it into the school books, it is not legitimate knowledge. If you cannot get it into Encyclopedia and Carta and Britannica, it is not going to enjoy the market share. Market share in retailing is controlled by distribution channels and not by the ability to produce. I can write all the books I want, but it can simply be ignored. So we must, we must as, as, as people who have, who have competence in managing industries, look at this as a knowledge industry, systematically and scientifically, understand where are the bottlenecks and who controls those bottlenecks, so we don't spend our resources producing knowledge which will never get distributed. So if you look at the industry model of knowledge production of India, the knowledge production of India is, it used to be during the colonial times in Britain, colonial Indology. And uh, since independence, it has shifted to United States in South Asian studies. That is where the knowledge production of India is happening. And this knowledge then gets franchised, I'm talking about social sciences knowledge, social sciences and humanities knowledge, 
this knowledge gets franchised to the Indian university system. So the Indian university systems use theories about Weber or Marx or whatever kind of theories are in fashion. And the reason they have to use Western theories rather than India-centric theories is because that's where the grants come from. That's what legitimizes the scholar. The scholar is in a hurry to go to the US, get a visa, uh, get their pu article published somewhere, become a, a visiting professor, uh, be a co-author with somebody with that kind of a reputation. And that's what builds their status even in India. So even the problem in India is driven by the kind of framing which is being done in the United States. It is not separately possible to go solve the India problem because the heavy funding like Ford Foundation funding, like Rockefeller Foundation funding, like all these different grants that are coming, and this is increasing by the way, that is too large uh, to be ignored. So a lot of Indian scholars are sucked in by the, by the carrots that they are offered. Now the, to understand the institutional mechanism that creates India studies, I want to invite you to follow me on a hypothetical example. I want to give you a kind of a thought experiment. And so please follow that thought experiment. Imagine if India were to do what United States is doing. So then we will see how it will work. So let's, let's, let's replicate what the structure of the industry is in the United States to study other cultures. And let's imagine that Indians set up the same thing. Suppose we were to have the same thing. Then, uh, you know, the starting point of all this was the private foundations. The first big private foundation was the Carnegie Foundation, then the Rockefeller Foundation, then the Ford Foundation. These are multi-billion dollar foundations each, and there's a couple of hundreds of them. Top 25, 30 are very, very powerful. So the first thing you would have to do in India is to set up an Ambani Foundation and a Narayan Murthy Foundation and a Birla Foundation and a Mahindra Foundation and a Tata's Foundation, focusing on not clean water and education and basic stuff, but on the, on the pursuit of Indian civilization as their primary goal. Because these Western, these American foundations were set up to promote the American manifest destiny, to promote a certain sense of American history, to, to the very explicit terms in the Carnegie Foundation documents, founding documents, and Rockefeller Foundation said that we have to create a certain idea of our history and teach it in our school systems to create that sense of superiority, that the sense of manhood, the sense of uh, supremacy over the world. So these private foundations were set up to influence Americans at home and also the rest of the world abroad. So this is the first thing. Imagine if we had such foundations in India run by Indian industrialists. So that's the first thing. Second part is these private foundations in the United States work very closely with the State Department. Uh, they, 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 the senior people go back and forth. Uh, the Ford Foundation guy may have been formerly a head of the FBI and vice versa. Uh, some State Department people go and work for Carnegie Endowment and somebody from Rockefeller gets into the State Department. There's movement back and forth ideologically. So this equivalent thing would be that the Ministry of External Affairs uh, and these different private foundations have a long-term alliance to promote India, India and Indian thought all over the region. And the further extension would be that uh, a Mani Foundation sets up a shop in Islamabad, and uh, Mahindra Foundation sets up a foundation in Lahore, and one of them sets up, another one sets up in, uh, in Nepal, and another one sets up in Sri Lanka. And what are they doing? They are, they are taking the cream of the Pakistani youth and giving them grants to study human rights violations in Pakistan. Uh, the one in Lahore is studying women's rights in Pakistan, and uh, the one in, uh, uh, in Rawalpindi is studying various castes and tribes that are fighting each other to figure out how we can intervene, who can be on our side, who can be co-opted to fight the other guy, uh, what is the, uh, and another foundation is giving grants, to, uh, Indian foundation I'm talking about in this hypothetical scenario, let's say is giving grants to find out all the political parties and, keep, and keeping them uh, and, and looking at the religion and so on. Now if there were this axis between the Indian government and private foundations, and they were, and they were camped out for the last 50 years, and they had, they had taken the cream of the thinkers, the youth, the liberal thinkers in those colleges, and Indianized them in their mindset, then you would have a situation similar to what the foreign institutions have done to the intellectuals in India. So the axis of private foundations and, and government in the United States fund the academy as knowledge workers who are being outsourced, who are for hire. They are, in, they are contractors. They are out looking for grants. 
Their prestige depends on how many grants they've got. Their ability to travel and do research and get hire other people and get photographs or do this or that, whatever they need for their research, depends on funding and their grants. So the funding sources are these. Uh, the prime foundations, the think tanks, and the government. And the scholars are hired guns. They go and perform. Uh, they, it, is, it is, at one level, there's a lot of individualism and free thinking. That is true. And Ajit is absolutely right. There is a lot of free thinking. But at another level, there is institutional mechanisms of funding and reward giving. And these institutional mechanisms do have an agenda. Uh, Americans are a very rational, objective, and fair people. But they're also a very competitive people a very brutally competitive people. And competition means you have a point of view, you have an agenda, you have a vested interest. And you are, while you're very objective as a businessman, and, and, and but you're also competitive as a businessman, so your objectivity is being utilized to further your particular point of view and your market share over competing brands. That is how America functions. So we do not want to think that because of, comp because of objectivity, fairness, and all that, therefore they don't have a particular point of view that they are trying to push. They are certainly trying to push a point of view, and they have institutional mechanisms for the past 75 years in place to, to feed these points of view through the, through the uh, academic system. And this output of India studies, which is managed by these uh, different in funding mechanisms, it then goes into the general public beyond the 2000. It goes to writers, it goes to the education system and feeds the textbooks, it goes to filmmakers, it goes to government policy makers. So the reason these 2000 people out of 300 million Americans are important is, is because they have a very large leverage over the thinking of the rest of society. And the, the Indian social sciences and humanities have lost any originality. Uh, the, 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 the models and theories are imported, and that's what the social scientists in India are trained to learn and prove that they are competent in it. And the final yardstick is that somebody overseas has, has endorsed them and said that you're okay. Otherwise, uh, otherwise they're not considered, uh, considered good enough. America is a land of ethnicities, and all ethnicities have the right to compete on a level playing field, but no one else will do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. So while Americans are very fair and very objective, they require that part of the meritocracy is that the Indians have to get organized and do this for themselves, not that sit there and expect someone else will do it for you. So this is very much the American way. Now, this is also, uh, uh, this is also good for America, this type of criticism, because it will put American foreign policy towards India on a positive course. America currently has a schizophrenia with respect to India. On the one hand, we have the government and business policy, which is very positive. On the other hand, you have the social sciences and humanities, which treats India as the world's worst nightmare of human rights problems, and looks at it through that angle, and looks at it as an opportunity for US intervention to fix India. The other reason uh, why this kind of a study is, uh, is legitimate and important is that there are stakeholders in India studies. It's not only the professors who are stakeholders in India studies, it's also students, like my kids, who go to college. And the average tuition is forty to $50,000 a year. And in America, consumers have rights. So as consumers of education, the students and their parents who are paying the bill have the right to go and criticize and say this is not legitimate knowledge. That is very much the American way. The non-Indian students who are being taught uh, nonsensical things about India are being, uh, they, 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 it's a disservice to them because imagine a student who learns all this stuff about Ganesh and so on and then he goes and gets a job with some multinational and comes and lives in Bangalore and he starts thinking that way about the Indians he meets with, he's not going to be very successful. Whereas if they were to teach uh, their, the, the next generation of Americans respect for India and treating India seriously, it would be good for America's foreign interests. So what I'm saying is actually good for American foreign interests. The Indians are also being approached as donors. There are, there's a $25 million uh, campaign for, by Harvard to raise money and by, similarly by various universities. And they're targeting Indians to donate money for India Studies chairs. And as we know, when a promoter wants you to invest, you have a right to cross-examine and do your due diligence. So you, it is very much the American way to criticize uh, India Studies when we are being approached to fund them. And, and finally, uh, we are the community being profiled, 
by the India studies. We, it's about us that they're talking about when they're saying these things. And as the community being profiled, we have a right to talk back. So th th these are the reasons I'm giving why this is not any, any, uh, anything anti-American. Finally, I want to uh, uh, conclude by saying that if you're a gardener, you can plant all the pl uh, roses and all the flowers you want, but if you don't pluck out the weeds, your garden will die. You, you cannot be a gardener and just say, I only do positive things, you know, I don't worry about negative things. Similarly, if you're in healthcare, you, if the person already has a disease that needs the pus to be removed or chemotherapy or radiation therapy or surgery, you cannot just say, I just give you vitamins and you keep doing positive things and you will be fine. There is a room for, there is a requirement to have the intervention to address critically to address problems. You cannot just do positive things which can then get ignored by the distribution channels and not make a difference. You have to intervene and that in fact is also the message of the Gita. You have to take action. Thank you. A versatile artist, Satish Gupta, is a painter, sculptor, poet, writer, printmaker, skilled draftsman, muralist, designer, calligrapher, and ceramist all in one. Winning the Sanskriti Award at, the early age, at an early age in his career, his work that comes in a fine blend of his skills in multitasking and a deep engagement with mysticism and Zen spirit has been exhibited in more than 32 solo shows at important art galleries within the country and abroad. His book, Centering Awareness, was recently released in Delhi along with his monumental copper sculpture of Shiva as Kalyan Sundara. Satish. Dear friends, um, I'm very uh, pleased to be here to share uh, a few of my thoughts on this, um, uh, this topic, uh, this book, which I'm very happy that's come out. And uh, this kind of thing has been happening. Um, you know, religion has been used and misused, and it's nothing new as to the ages. Um, this we have seen how how a few people in power have always used it to their advantage. My struggle has been always to um, go beyond religion in a sense and to find that, that purity, that energy that links us, all the religions together. Well, as I said earlier, the religion has been used by fanatics and we see around us today is indeed insane and that's what is happening to all the uh, people in what that we've been talking about all this time and there's so much violence in the name of God there is so much uh, power struggle um, this is nothing else but what is happening it is enough to make everybody an atheist but I strongly believe that faith in a purity is still the fabric that holds humanity together. There is an order in this universe, this seemingly chaotic universe. As a sensitive person, I can only say that the way out is not by screaming or shouting or backing, breaking and burning or destroying, which we, you know, a few um, crazy people do. Um, and that, I think, leads to a misconception, it leads to a thing which when somebody's talking sane also that is that fact is misused and uh, we give fodder to people who are um, fanatics and that is something that we really need to watch out. Spirituality can easily become bondage, a very comforting prison. Thank you. I would now like to invite Swami Shantatmananda ji and I'd like to introduce him. Revered Swami Shantatmananda has just taken over as the secretary of the Ramakrishna Mission, New Delhi. He succeeds Swami Gokulananda as an able administrator and spiritual mentor in the continuing tradition of his predecessor. Swamiji's expertise in the area of financial administration and fund management has been the cornerstone of financial transparency and accountability at the headquarters of the Ramakrishna Mission in Belur Mutt, 
Kolkata, where he had a long stint of 30 years. During his tenure, the branch centers of the worldwide Ramakrishna mission received new impetus in streamlining their financial records and policies. This went to further reinforce the outstanding degree of transparency and propriety in matters of finance where the Ramakrishna mission is known to embody in its administration. Swamiji was also a pioneering influence in setting up an NGO in the suburbs of Kolkata called Sharda Seva Sangha, which is managed by 100 trained women volunteers. It happens to be one of his exceptional achievements in the area of women's empowerment, which is a developmental area close to his vision of nation building. The other areas which continue to relentlessly engage him with human development are disaster management and value education. Swamiji is a self-professed advocate of a character building and man-making value education based on universal right, insights, which are common to all spiritual traditions, mm -hmm. as presented by Vivekananda and Vedanta, which he feels should impact our educational structure and policies extensively. Swamiji is also acutely knowledgeable in the art, form, and practices of ritualistic worship to which the Ramakrishna mission has imparted its own pristine tradition of spirituality. Swamiji is very close to youngsters and inspires them towards a life of purpose, dedication, and service with a rare passion that is characteristic of the mission of Swami Vivekananda. We are really honored to have you, Swamiji. I would request you to say a few words. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amrathangamaya Om Shanti 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 Friends, I came to know about this uh, wonderful occasion only this afternoon, thanks to Shrutiji. And I feel really happy that I could get a chance to participate in this. So, I am not much aware of this uh, book or those developments, but I just glanced through the book and uh, it's very clear that the authors deserve all congratulations and encouragement for a wonderful effort. In fact, more and more such efforts would go a long way in help a better understanding of India in the United States and also other Western countries. This one of the items dealt in the book I shall briefly touch about it because after all the great scholarly speeches that you have heard, I would like to bring the audience to a little down-to-earth level and talk a little more about at a easily understandable language and level. You see, the one aspect, what has been said about the book Kali's Child, I will discuss briefly about that, but then we can take it as a representative approach to the other works also. So although even that book I haven't read because uh, we got a copy of it, some of the monks, but we could hardly go through the first few pages because it's such worthless stuff. We thought that it is, it's not worth wasting our time over such a work. But then we could understand the approach of the author basically. And that's what uh, I would like to tell you briefly about. See, probably it is uh, centered on this postmodernist approach of trying to read in between lines, always trying to find a negative meaning as to what is apparently visible on the surface. This is one of the approaches probably our scholars would uh, endorse that view, whether I am correct. So, Kripal has taken a very deliberate stand that uh, whatever is apparent, whatever is talked about, it's all different and he should delve deep into that and do a lot of psychoanalysis and all that. Unfortunately, he got as a research guide a person who is totally unfit to be a research guide. That Wendy Donegar, she has done quite a lot of damage all around, I believe. I think in several other works are also she's been quoted. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, although they have, they are supposed to have done a psychoanalysis of Sri Ramakrishna's life, I think it is they who deserve to be psychoanalyzed and shown the <laughs> right approach to life. So, you see, the point is, it's uh, Sri Ramakrishna is now 
accepted being accepted world over by more and more people it's not just gullible indians or hindus who don't know much or who are not intellectual and all that great scholars have written extraordinary things about him they've analyzed his life in depth and you see a person at least no i hope kripal would give some concession to swami vekan at least in terms of his understanding or his intellectual powers and all that so such a person had lived very closely with him observed him day and night and in fact swami ji was very famous for his rejecting anything that was not to his uh, would where it would fail his test of truth or acceptability so i don't think he would have tolerated even the least if ever there was any such tendency in sri ramakrishna now the main problem comes from kripal's total lack of knowledge in depth of the bengali language and much more the nuances of the expressions used quite often he forms wrong opinions we know he had come to our institute of culture in calcutta sat in the library and with the dictionary he was trying to understand the works of sri ramakrishna so how can such a person produce any work worth its name so obviously he was quite off the target now what really set us thinking also whether there is any greater sinister motive behind all this is it just a intellectual work or are they afraid of such influences spreading across in america whether somebody is really funding people to write such deliberate works such influences are cup that is of course probably rajiv ji may be able to throw greater light on such matters because he has been dealing with every such topic so the, well, what we thought was several requests came to us for writing a rebuttal and uh, contradicting whatever yes so some of the seniors in the belmont even there was i believe there was some discussion in the rajya sabha and finally pro, um, professor I mean dr narsimha rao himself discussed about it and there was a talk of banning that book also then finally we said that no by banning it only unnecessarily giving it undue importance and uh, more and more people would start reading it for nothing we more than anything else we were worried that people shouldn't waste their time reading such books we were not worried about any damage being done to hinduism or to sri ramakrishna for that matter so that way you know we we never thought that it is something worth being contradicted in a great deal still one of our swamis in america swami tyagaranda has done extensive work on that he has produced large i mean uh, a huge volume i think of writings contradicting many of the things which uh, professor kripal has analyzed and he is supposed to have unearthed and found and all that and in fact uh, personally at least Uh, dr kripal himself had acknowledged that he had made several errors in that book now the officially perhaps he didn't come out with any such declaration they had met also a few times he came down to our center uh, where uh, swami tyagarand is uh, staying and so they had discussions now the main the idea the hindu or the indian idea of religion mysticism spirituality etc are totally different see Uh, probably dr kripal and many others were writing such books they have been largely influenced by some of the happenings in the christian monasteries in a big way their homosexuality is a terrible problem and also you know the debates that are going on even in the american parliament etc etc whether it should be made it publicly whether it should be allowed and things like that whether in the churches it should be made you know actually they are they should be allowed to have that kind of a uh, involvement so in the context of all that probably some of it might have been written also that might have influenced them and num- another most important factor is you know they have been dealing it at a very very totally different level right for example the experiential part of a spiritual life the type of things that are being talked about i think really really they are totally incompetent to deal with at these levels so obviously there's a huge gap between that understanding and what sri ramakrishna's life was so obviously you know they were nowhere near that they only went through some of the literature and all that try to have some analysis and uh, completely you know it was totally irrelevant quite off the mark and uh, really it has no meaning whatsoever that is why some of these books have come about like that so the whatever uh, our friends have done it's a no doubt a wonderful effort and it would go definitely a long way to at least remove some of the misgivings but then you know as uh, rajiv ji has uh, clearly said you know more and more there might be you know this uh, such kind of stray writings here and there but the fact is 
a larger and larger number of people are taking to indian spirituality they are coming to india you know the huge following even people like uh, sri ravi shankar ji and others are having today so that is pointing to something different you just wait now our uh, swami ramdev is going to burst like a bomb shell in the american society and you will see their reaction so you see the the, the influence on the other side is much more larger and much more powerful so let such few straight things also be there maybe so that to know that what is really good and what's really bad at least to distinguish that way some of it is pr probably one can't avoid all that however we once again congratulate the authors and we wish them success and i hope they will follow it up with further works thank you uh kapil ji would you like to make some comments friends shruti ji and rajiv ji asked me to join you all here i was reluctant and said that i would hesitate to be in the house that is in my own home and be a guest aur main hindi mein ye kaha aur i hope you man ka ki ghar walon ko to nahi na bulate hai na bahar walon ko bulate hai atithi banane ke liye to ghar walon ko hi bula liya ki chief guest ye kaun si baat hai to ye to hinduism nahi hai moti baat hai e ये देखो अभी कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी शुरू हो गई ना सो बहुत ही रिलेक्टेंस से मैं यहाँ पर आई इफ आई मे स्वामी जी सेड महाराज सेड आई एम गोइंग टू ब्रिंग डाउन फ्रॉम हाइट ऑफ एकेडमिक इंटेलेक्चुअल टू डाउन टू अर्थ वन यू टॉक अबाउट अबाउट I how do you pronounce him I thought it was a proper Punjabi name Kirpal ha yeah. huh? so I don't know what this americanized is I don't know what this is Kirpal Kirpal cry paul oh i see <laughs> like nine paul so to delhi delhi mein aisa hota tha ki jiska naam jack kishan hota tha uska naam jackson ho jata tha so i have documentation on that and so this is one of those cases all right fine got it so i want to bring it down even to the ghar ki language and in the ghar ki bhasha whether it is in the two or three languages that i speak and listen ki hamare yahan ye sab ho तो पंजाबी में उसको कहते हैं मत मारी होइए मत मारी होइए तो या आगरा भेज दो नहीं तो रांची भी भाई जगह नहीं है बंगला में कहते हैं कि बाजी कथा बाबा थक गए ये सब छोड़ पे आज जमी आपने बोले कि सब बाजी कथार कि करब तुम निजे बाड़ी अशुद्ध हो तो थे ठाकुर एंड इन तमिल ले से पाव अम्मा सो दैट टेक्स केयर ऑफ इट एम आई राइट एंड सो ऑन एंड सो फोर्थ इन शॉर्ट दैट in the tradition of discourse there is a very strong tradition of rejection of that which is not valid at any level emotional intellectual social and public and therefore when i wish to make just one or two remarks on what i have heard of these very very valuable uh presentations here which moved on different 
levels. Swamiji and as Maharaj certainly said that in the tradition of not wasting your time on something which is not symbolic or a symptom of any kind of health. Because you're dealing here, whether psychoanalysis or not, you're here dealing with disease. They say in the English language that beauty lies in the eyes of the observer. We may say in this language that ugliness and filth lies in the eyes of the observer, whether it is Hinduism or whether it is any other ism, Islam or Christianity or Judaism or any other thing. Because this relationship of the observer and what the observer is, which is all part of inherent in Dr. Arvind Sharma's preface to this volume, which is a very cogent piece of writing, and Dr. Sharma, I want to congratulate you as always, is that we have to look at this issue also in terms of the entire negotiation and the mediation that takes place. And that mediation of what is being observed is as important as who is the observer. Whether that observer is in your terminology the insider or the outsider, but how do you really say who is the insider or the outsider? Is it my skin? Is it something else? And it is this ability to go within that and there we cannot, with all the respect in the world for everything, cannot make a distinction that I am more of an insider only because I happen to be born in India. In fact, we are more outsiders to ourselves as Dr. Arvind Sharma very rightly pointed out, at least one section. And I think that this is the lesson that this book or any other books teach you. And in that, the points that appear in terms of what Swamiji said in respect of this particular thing, which I think is really, really laughable in, at one level. And as you have, we don't have to go to the misreadings of the Bhagavad and in terms of what Ganesh was, I would like to make him sit down and say, Kachar, now I'll tell you lots more stories about Ganesh and I couldn't keep him busy for at least a month or so. And then he can be busy for the next 10 years because Indian mythology is so varied, so multi-leveled that oldies and booyahs like me have spent some time trying to find out what is the meaning of this? Is physical? Is it emotional? Is it representational? No category doesn't fit. Because the categories of the country and the categories that it evolves are both multi-layered, they are multi-dimensional and they are fluid and reversible. And unless one has understood this, whether it is you're born there or you're born here, you cannot enter this amphibian called Hinduism. <laughs> and it's precisely its ability to move on different planes that makes it very difficult for whether the insider or the outsider to interpret. And I think that we have to address ourselves to this. Because in the very nature of, the f of its dynamics, and in the very nature of its first statement, whether the Vedas are Hindu or not is a question mark, as 
you as the great professor of religion would probably bear out. And that, and if it says, ekam sat and viprabhuda vadanti, then it is inherent in the conception <laughs> that there have to be multiple interpretations of that one. And in that multiple interpretations, we have a long tradition of discourse in which within the tradition, there have been not only multiple, but there have been what the outsider, whether he's Indian born or not, has said contradictory positions. This country is full of contradictions. In fact, this country is only country or whatever we are, civilization or culture or religion, the only thing that it is that it explores possibilities and probabilities which psychoanalysis, neither Freud or for that matter Jung had looked at in terms of the dimensions of the human existence and predicament. And therefore, the tangible symbols which come up as myth, as icon, as, I don't even call it religion. Because these are different methodologies. And can you say, therefore, that Hinduism is only Ganesh or Devi or Shiva, whether they're denigrated or not is besides the point. But I don't believe in any one of them. I'm a very good Hindu. And I believe in all of them. I dance them all, to, all the time. So it is not a question in terms of looking at what one would say a stream of representation of a very complex uh, mode of expression and articulation through categories which Rajiv with all respect to you categories which are only cognitive and intellectual and cannot be comprehended on that ground. So the mismatch is right there. And I think that this, any student of Indian tradition, and I say tradition or traditions or the multiple levels of that, and it is there instead of taking on with utmost respect, uh, taking on particular issues and saying that you have a phallus obsession, now get out of it. And that this is not phallus. You have a menstrual blood obsession, get out of it. That's not the point. It is the point and it's not the point. Because the issue really is how obsessed you are. <laughs> and behind that obsession is something deeper. And that is that you consider the physical human being and his anatomy and physiology as being primary. <laughs> and supposing we just turn that round, because there is more to it. We have never denied the existence of this level. From the word go, the Vedas are full of it. The brother Arunakya Upanishad is, <laughs> speaks of it. So what's the problem? What's itching you? Now, therefore, I come back to the question of 
this observer-observed relationship and the fact that such examples are indicators of very deep disjunctions in the human psyche as of today. That's how I look at it. Dr. Arun Sharma, I'd like to address just a few remarks to what your brilliant and most cogent uh, presentation was of two things. One, that it is true that India by and large, by and large only, that the self-image is a derived self-image. And when we make that, I'd like to make a footnote for a certain section of the Indian intelligentsia. I am one of them. <laughs> Bad choice, but never mind, I happen to be that. And as I have given uh, Rajiv Malhotra my paradigm of the five M's, which he can expound on mm, and tell you what the educated Indian is today. So the problem is, is, is with us. And that, and it is with us in terms of those, in terms of those whose training, alas, has deprived them from a total engagement of primary sources and primary languages at the cognitive level. Because we are reading Sanskrit in English. And how do I translate? And if my equipment is restricted, my equipment is a vicarious equipment, then how do I get to the sources? And that takes one to the whole question of the placement of the study of languages and scripts in this country, more than the question of departments of religious studies. And so I think that we have to address ourselves to this. And there have been very fine exponents also of looking at other religions, which includes Christianity and Islam, who were not born into it. So for me, the argument that since I happen, I don't know whether I was born into it or not, God only knows. Uh, so that therefore it gives me a special uh, privilege or an authority. I think that we have to think about that. However, it is true that for historical reasons, and what he alluded to very validly, was what we in the academia now I can turn and turn my identities, you know, elsewhere there. I've been half and half uh, in the American academia and the uh, thrown out from both, but never mind. So that there is a problem there. There is a problem in terms of what the nature of the discourse has been in what we know as the Orientalist, post-Orientalist, modern and post-modern in the sphere of the study of civilizations. And one has moved from whatever Edward Said has said, and some of that is valid, and as, but one knows that today there is another type of a new orientalism <laughs> to which we have to address ourselves. That takes one to the third uh, dimension of this. And I have mm, the very important point on human rights, which was raised by Dr. Arvind Sharma. And I think he is dead right. And that is an operation thing also that we should, it's a, it is an operational. But now, from the level of experience to the level of cognition, 
I want to get to the level of organization which Rajiv Malhotra spoke about. Whether we belong to those who have our uh, disciples and mm, speakers or uh, followers of Foucault's mm, thesis on power and knowledge, it is true. And something in me, you know, kind of creeps in revulsion when I say knowledge, production, industry. No, Baba, I am not industry in industry. I am not in industry. और मेरा तो सारा काम विचार पर है अब ये कह रहे हैं कि जी मैं तो कांग्रेस हूँ but he has a point he has a point that we had a different type of and to take your semantics of an industry there was a very large industry of the production of knowledge in this country and that production of knowledge was certainly which we have known in these different sampradayas, in the gharana systems, in the shakhas, from the word go. And there was both a complementarity as also a contestation between and amongst those knowledge systems. And I wish to God that that, that would continue because that was the resilience and the dynamics of this tradition. However, that industry was also impacted sometimes by what one would call political power, but not always. Because they were not propelled by foundations, they were propelled by civil action and civic society supporting the different shakhas and the sampradayas. Where is that civic society, I say today, without going to the capital market? Have we seen how all these were? Even a Raja Raj Chol was not looking after those much, let me tell you. And anyone has, who has done work on primary material, on inscriptions, on epigraphy, and so on, will tell you that, yes, there was a nexus between political power and the production of knowledge, but not always. And that the production of knowledge industry was autonomous for many other reasons. And I think this is an issue that we have to deal with in terms of the application of certain institutional and organizational and structures in order to understand what is happening now and what happened within the tradition. That's my submission here. And it is a complex matter. And what if restoration has to be done and a realignment has to be done I think as much as we may be critical, I think we need to be also self-critical of what we are doing about it. You are absolutely right in terms of what you have laid out. And it is not only a question of having departments of religious studies. And incidentally, as a again old and person on the way out, let me tell you that there's this discussion within the not only the academia but the power structure goes back 50 years. And I think you might want to read the correspondence between Maulana Azad and Sidi Deshmukh on the subject of the introduction. Mm -hmm. And this, this continues today at levels of UNESCO and so on, of what the Indian position is. I have said more than I, and you're losing your audience now. I'm also losing them, but they're with you. Finally, Satish, who spoke first, and who spoke 
last because if there wasn't this Catholicism of embracing whether it was Thakur or whether it is this young man because religion is not religion mm -hmm. and if you can any path if it teaches you both this and this and this life is done I would like to invite comments and questions from the audience. And I would like to request uh, Tavleen, uh, who's written in the Indian Express today, who has mentioned this issue and the book. I would request you to make a short comment on this. I really have got involved in this uh, because I. I listened to Shruti's voice singing these wonderful shlokas that I thought had gone out of business in India. And I think that really what worries me is uh, that there isn't an invasion of the sacred type book on India. Because, you know, at no time, I think, in the history of Indian civilization has our idea of what religion is been more important. We are not saying to anyone, this is our book and this is our prophet and he had a little talk with God and you better believe me or I'm going to kill you. There's not one Indian religion that says that. But we have, you know, I don't share Ajit's view that we are confident. I think we're so unsure that we are, we get stuck on attacking. I said this to Rajiv the other day and I really believe it to be true. The Western civilization is superior to ours because it's a civilization of self-examination. We need to do this to ourselves, to find out why it is that our own children don't come forward and write a thousand more books like the one that's just come out. So, you know, my only comment is that I really hope that the guys who brought out this book are going to bring out one now on India, on invading the sacred within India. Please introduce yourself. No, it matters to us, please, because we want to know who is asking the question. So okay. please introduce us yourself. The question I have to, for Mr. Malhotra, uh, he, you mentioned, sir, about the use of human rights for interventionism in India and how it has been used by the American political uh, system to get involved in India uh, to our disadvantage. My question to you, is was it not the Indian community that sponsored Congressman Stephen Solars, who in fact went around calling himself Congressman from India, from Brooklyn, who then came to India with that support with which he got elected. Brooklyn, as we know, is also referred to in America, in the underworld as Crooklyn, which is predominantly Jewish and black and uh, Hispanic population. It's also the place where the group Dot Busters used to go around uh, targeting Indian women who wore the bindi that uh, the ladies spoke about. Th that this group Dot Buster actually killed uh, Dauro's Bodhi, as you remember, perhaps. Dauro's Bodhi, a, a Parsi uh, uh, yeah, what's the youth. Question? Yeah. The question is, this Mr. Solars came to India with the apparently the tacit approval of the Indian community and on a human rights uh, mission to probe human rights in Punjab in the wake of the Khalistan, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 conspiracy that was going on at the time. I think my voice is bad, you're saying too long. Yeah, the, so, so, my, my, so my question is, no, my just, question is... Not a talk, but just a question. Right, my question is, you say, uh, how can you de-link the, the role of the Indian community which supported Solars who, 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 whose human rights campaign in Punjab was the smoke screen for US in involvement here and also the, the Sikh community in India 
which sponsored 20 congressmen on an anti-India bill, for example, in the Congress, uh, including Molly Herger and other right-wing ideologues. Okay, so okay I think we'll you, stop the question uh, here. So, yeah. so how can you deal like the role of the Indian community and is it not time that the Indian community puts its own house in order before it points fingers at others? Okay, that's it, yes. Rajiv, please answer that question. Okay, okay. Yes. I, I uh, analyzing, there's one simple question, which is what is the relationship between the NRI community and U.S. policies towards India vis-a-vis -vis human rights interventions. Now, NRI community is not one monolithic community. NRI community is very fractionalized. There is the pro-Khalistan people there. Uh, there is a lot of people who are anti-India and anti-national in the NRI community. And this may be news to you, but NRI community is not all patriotic Indians. A lot of the uh, people who are doing this nasty work in the American Academy are Indians. A lot of the people who are graduates from uh, Indian universities, they aspire to go and get into this kind of uh, muck and they're encouraged. So a whole lot of Indians have been co-opted. One, one, one of the brilliances of the American system is its ability to bring people from various cultures, make them feel at home, give them patronage, and yet get them gradually into a certain point of view. So I have dozens of examples of uh, Indians in the American Academy, in the American intelligentsia, whose work is very detrimental to, to India. And I plan on doing a book in the future which will name names. But today I don't want to name names. But there are some very prominent people in top Ivy League places, including places like Harvard, Indians, who, are, who, who's you, who, who use their power in ways that's rather detrimental to India. I first want to say that uh, much as secularism is the future of mankind because it, it depends on you and me saying that we are equals and every culture has an equal place on this earth. But unfortunately, events have not shown that. Though we may say we are secular, religion, in my experience, penetrates music, dance, your tourism, literature, everything. I'll give you one instance of what happened to me two years ago when I was in England and I was going on a bus journey from London to Edinburgh. We had a very learned guide to take us through. And at some point when we were entering Scotland, she said, the Scottish king many, many years ago, uh, James I, came to London, England, married an English princess and became, having accepted the religion of the crucifix, became civilized. I did not answer her then, but when we reached Edinburgh on that rainy night, I said, what was he before? She said, he was some heathen worshipper of the sun. Now, I think that my observation of the world scene, education, etc., tells me that everything, the seed of all trouble in the world, is one person telling the other that I am superior, my way of life is superior, I am better because I am a man or because I am a Christian or because I am an Islamic person, my religion is better than yours. And all this is happening because Hinduism is seen as a lesser, uh, religion by those who colonized India, those who used India, and those who found that there is something wrong. I feel there is something wrong in every religion. But that is not exposed, that is not talked about, and quite often we ourselves do this disservice to ourselves, saying that our culture is full of dowry debts, etc., instead of, instead of saying what is positive about it. I think as long as people go on saying that I am superior to you for whatever reason, whites, blacks, men, women, Hindus, Christians, whatever, the secularism that we dream of cannot come, come into our lives. This is my feeling. So I think, uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation. And thank you, Rajiv ji, uh, Balachandran ji, Professor Sharma, and Ajit ji. Um, we are very, very honored by our insights. Uh, we are very, uh, it's been very revealing all your comments and your insights and I think all of us have a lot to think about and more important than thinking a lot to act upon so with that thought we will come back to discuss this in the future